Charles uh, Haddon Spurgeon was a well-known preacher back in the 19th century in London, England. And there was a widow that they knew of who, uh, she didn't have any funds and she was uh, to pay her rent and she was in danger of losing her place to stay. And uh, so the church that he was involved with decided to take up a collection and uh, put together some funds to pay the rent. So Mr. Spurgeon went to her home, to her apartment, and knocked on the door. Of course, this was back in the 1800s. She, he knew she was home. Uh, she wouldn't have been out traveling like so many people are today. But uh, he knocked on the door and there was no answer. And he knocked again. And there was no answer. Couldn't quite understand it. He knocked again. And still no answer. And after some time, he decided, well, she's got to be home. I wonder if there's something wrong with her. So he opened the door and peeked in. And she was sitting in the back of her apartment and uh, just sitting there. So he asked her, well, why didn't you answer the door? And she said, I thought you were the rent collector. And I knew I was going to be thrown out. Well, of course, he told her that he had come with a gift to pay for her rent. Now, this morning, um, as we look at this passage about the law, really the law is like the rent collector knocking on your door. and You don't have the rent to pay. And the gift that uh, Mr. Spurgeon brought... Um, <clears throat> was like uh, the gift that what Christ has done for us. Now this morning, uh, we're looking at um, <clears throat> the first half of Romans 7. Romans 7 is really a great chapter in the book of in the Word of God. And uh, as there are many passages, it's hard to say that one is better than another, but it is a great chapter, one of the great chapters in the Bible. And we're going to be looking at the subject of being released from the law this morning. And next week, we're going to see about being released from the struggle that born-again believers experience oftentimes in their lives. And there's two uh, word pictures that are used in this chapter. One great, Al was talking about word pictures a little earlier. There's one great word picture in the first half, and then in the last half of the chapter, there's another great word picture. And we'll get to that next week, Lord willing. Now, this chapter is about the law. We'll read it through, the first 14 verses. And in these verses, the law appears in every verse, either as the law or the commandment. And <clears throat> it appears 18 times in the 14 verses. Clearly, it's dealing with law, the law, in various forms. So let's just read the passage. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living... She is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law, through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear f fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, and that's where we get the title of this uh, week's passage message from. We have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. This is a key verse in this passage. Just read that verse 6 again. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. 
verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity uh, through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. But rather it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. That through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. So this morning I'd like to look at this passage, first 14 verses in three areas. First of all, we want to look at the activity of the law, what it does, what it is, what it does, the problem with the law, some of the problems to do with it, and what is the purpose of the law? What is its purpose? And then secondly, we'll look at the applicability of the law. You know, this passage gives us insight into how um, you know, we ask many questions in life. For example, you know, what principle governs my life? What is the principle that governs your life? What about uh, the Gentile, the heathen? What about Adam? What principle governed his life? And how, uh, what is it that governs us? And so we'll look at that under the applicability of the law. To whom does it apply? And finally, the annulment of the law. That's literally what this verse 6 is about. How are we released from it? As we go through here. Well, first of all, quickly, it's activity. The law, uh, the term law that's used in the New Testament Greek is really, it means to divide. It's a divider. It's like you come to the, uh, a, a branch in the road and you, it divides. You go one way or the other. And it also can be defined as unwritten customs and formal decrees. Both types of things. Now, in Vine's dictionary, he uh, says that this term law that's used, the law or law, is used in four different ways in the New Testament, particularly in the Pauline epistles. First of all, law expresses a general principle. For example, in uh, Romans 3 and 27, which we've already looked at, we read, Where then is boasting it is excluded? By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. The law of faith. It's a general principle. So that's the first way in which it's used. But law is also used as a force or an influence. That's the second way that he describes its use. And in our chapter, we'll be coming to that next week, but down in verse 21 of uh, chapter 7, uh, the Apostle Paul says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in my inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind. So it's a, it's a principle or a force, an influence in our lives. But clearly, the law or law is used in terms of the Mosaic law. Um, <clears throat> what we call the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments. And for example, in verse 4 of our chapter that we've just read, Therefore, my brethren, you also are made to die to the law. That's referring to the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. So it can be used in that sense. And it's also used in terms of the books of the Bible. And for example, in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 21, and this occurs many places in the New Testament, but uh, where this passage says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, referring to the books of the Old Testament. So it, that's another way in which it's used. But it has a problem. There is a problem with the law. Because the law made 
no one perfect. That's the first problem that we encounter with the law. Romans 3 and 23, a verse you're familiar with, says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. In chapters 1 to 3 we looked at, there is none righteous, no, not one. It makes no one perfect. In fact, that's repeated in uh, Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter uh, 7, we read something similar. And uh, it says that in verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect. The law cannot make us perfect. <clears throat> also in chapter 10, verse 1 of Hebrews, the same thing is emphasized again. For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifice year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. The law cannot make perfect. Secondly, it's external. It cannot change a person. It's an external thing. You read about what Jesus had to say about the Pharisees. It was very outward. You know, it can change our appearance. It's like, uh, you know, it can house train us, as, some, as someone has said. Um, and this is one of the dangers, even in evangelicalism. You know, we put on an appearance of doing certain things of the law, whereas in reality our heart is not, not really conformed to that. An example of that would be, uh, maybe you have a pet, and uh, you've tried to train your pet. Well, we took our dog, Taffy, uh, years ago to uh, dog obedience school. It was at Fellows High School and went there several weeks, and she would do just exactly what you commanded. I mean, she'd walk right at your heel and, and sit and whatever, come when you called her. Trained, really well trained. Now, she failed the final test of the school. I don't know why, but... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, even with all these other dogs and trainers there, they could train your dog to do exactly what she was supposed to do. One time we were up at the lake, and uh, she loved the water. So w the trouble is, when we went out swimming, she liked to jump up on you and everything else. Quite a big dog. And so we put her inside our tent trailer, locked her in the tent trailer this day uh, so that she wouldn't be out in the water. It was the only way we could keep her out of the water. Well, she knew, like, she, she wouldn't eat any food or anything like that, any of our food. I mean, there's no way she would get I me mean, so well trained. But unfortunately, Beverly had left a dozen muffins in the tent trailer. Well, when we came back in, there wasn't a single crumb left. You see, when we were away, we weren't watching. That's what happened. You see, that's like the law. You know, we can pretend when we're, hey, we're with each other here. We can pretend certain things, but sometimes when we're really away from each other or in our corner, in our closet, then, well, maybe it's a little different. This is a, this is a problem that the law has, one of the problems. Another problem, and we read about this in uh, verse 5, what I've referred to as its incitement to sin. Now, that may sound harsh, but verse 5 of our chapter, which we've read, said, uh, <clears throat> while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members. These sinful passions were aroused by the law. And verse uh, 7, For what shall we say? Is the law sin? No. But I would have not have come to no sin except through the law. In verse 8, But sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me all of these things. And down in verse 11, For sin taking opportunity through the commandment deceived me. And so on. It's like, it's like uh, this, uh, the flagship hotel in Galveston, Texas, which sits on a pier out in the Gulf of Mexico. And in this picture, the, uh, the dining room and so on is on the other side, facing the Gulf. And one, uh, there's a beautiful dining room on the ground floor with big plate glass windows. You sit right there over top of the Gulf. Beautiful spot, apparently. I've never been there. And uh, the rooms are sitting up above with balconies. And someone had the bright idea once to try fishing from the balcony. So he cast their line out, and it wasn't long enough or snagged or whatever happened to it. Had a big sinker on the end, and it swung in, and bang, you know what happened. It hit one of the plate glass windows and bust the window. So the hotel had the bright idea, well, we better put up signs saying, no fishing from the balcony. Well, what happened? 
they found that people started fishing from the balcony on a regular basis. And uh, they had a real problem with it, so they realized, hey, we better take these signs down. This just sort of encourages people to, to do this. This is another problem with the law uh, and the Ten Commandments as well. The other thing, the other problem relating to this is its condemnation and death was the result. It's not the purpose of it, but that's the result of the law. Condemnation and death. And we've already read again in verse 9. Um, Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. It's the result. The end result. And same in verse 10. As a result, it proved to result in death for me. The commandment. And in verse 11, and through it, it killed me. So its condemnation was the result. But you know, um, it's not the. It, you might think of um, the policeman and the traffic stop. You know, one time we were up in uh, uh, Tobermore when Benton and Lorna were in the training center in Durham. We took a drive up to have a visit with them and uh, towards the up in the Bruce Peninsula and cruising along a beautiful day, a nice open highway, and all of a sudden, you know, I saw the red lights flashing and. Uh, the policeman stopped us and wanted to know how fast I was going. I didn't know how fast I was going, but obviously going above the speed limit. You know, I was all, you know, we were just enjoying the, t- the day. We were enjoying being with uh, Benton and Lorna, just, in, you know, in clear conscience, driving along the road, and all of a sudden, bang, there's the stop in front of you. And uh, he asked, well, are you rushing to catch the ferry at Tobermore? No, no, we're not taking the ferry. But at any rate, he ended up giving us the ticket. And uh, we had to pay the fine, the penalty. See, that's like, it's like the, uh, the law. I mean, the law is there as the policeman holding up the stop sign or, uh, and so on. But, and the penalty is there. I had to pay the penalty. I had to pay the, the price of the ticket. But was it the policeman's fault? It wasn't his fault. It was my fault for exceeding the speed limit. I mean, the law is not at fault. It's It's not the law, per se, but it's our sin that leads to condemnation. But it is a problem in that, in a sense. Well, we might, so on your outline, just to conclude this, uh, this problem, the problem of law of any kind is that it is powerless to change a person. It can only reveal sin and bring condemnation and death. It's external, not internal can only change you outside, not inside. Now, what is the purpose of the law? What is its purpose? We've read, it does not cause us to sin, said directly in verse 7. What shall we say is the law of sin? May it never be, on the contrary. I would not have known sin except in the law. It does not cause us to sin. And it also says, we read further down, that the law is holy, and it's righteous, and it's good. Romans uh, 7, verse 12. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. In verse 14, it says it's spiritual. It's quite interesting. But that's not the purpose of it. That describes some some aspects of it. But what's its purpose? What is the purpose of the law? The moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. Well, sin, uh, we think about sin... And the definition of sin is missing the mark. For example, if you were to shoot an arrow at a target like here. Now, this, in this case, the person has hit the bullseye. But basically, sin is, is uh, missing the mark. The arrow comes short. We read in 1 John 3 and 4 that sin is lawlessness. Well, what's the target? You see, sin is missing the mark. What is the target that we're shooting at? So you shoot your arrow and it misses the mark. What's the target? According to 1 John 3 and 4, the target is the law. Sin is lawlessness. But also, in Romans 3 and 23, which we've already referred to, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, we've missed the target. What's the target in 6 and 23? It's the glory of God. So the, the law relates to the glory of God. And what is the glory of God? 
Its purpose, you see, is to reveal the moral character of God. It tells us what God is really like. That's the purpose of the law. The glory of God, it's the, it reveals the moral character of God. When you stop and think about it, thou shalt not bear false witness. God never lies. He is absolutely faithful. He is the epitome of the realization of that, of that commandment. And you can go down the list. And God is the one, it, it speaks of the character of God, the moral character of God. However, <clears throat> when we, we consider this, um, the purpose of the law, there's, uh, <clears throat> we should read in, um, in 2 Corinthians 3 and 16, which we read earlier, and I'm going to read this passage, because this is a key passage, because the fact is that there is something or someone who has revealed, who does reveal the moral character of God far greater, far better than the law of God. It was only a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality of the moral character of God is found in Jesus Christ. He came into this world as the Son of God. And he demonstrated the moral character of God. And that's what 2 Corinthians uh, 3 is speaking about in verse 6. Five, we'll start at verse 5. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Verse 6, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, that speaks of the law, not of the letter, but, <clears throat> um, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The old, the commandments, they kill. They result in death. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It results in death. But the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. The only time that we, that's recorded where God wrote literally with his, on, on a piece of stone. These commandments, uh, it <clears throat> says, with the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, which they did. Think of the glory of the mountain and all that that happened back in the book of Exodus. So that the sons of Israel could not look intently on the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, Fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? So here we have something that is far greater. It goes back to, to uh, <clears throat> verse 6 that we read. We are under the ministry of the Spirit. For if the ministry of condemnation, referring to the law, has glory, which it does, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case is no glory on account of the glory that surpasses it. So it is superseded by a far better revealer of uh, <clears throat> God's moral character. So on your outline, we can say the purpose of the Mosaic Law of the Ten Commandments was to reveal the moral character of God. The, the law reveals what God is like so we can know what God intended us to be like. We were made in the image of God. So it, it shows us that. But it has been replaced by something better. Now let's talk a bit about its, applica its applicability. Where it's too big for me. But um, what about Adam? First of all, Adam, he was given one law. Don't eat of the, tree of the no fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One commandment. That was the law. Of course, he failed. And uh, as a result, sin and death entered the world. So he, Adam was under one law. Now, the patriarchs, what about uh, the Old Testament people like Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the ones that we read of in the Old Testament, of the nation of Israel, well, before the nation of Israel, the patriarchs. What law were they under? Well, if you read, for example, 
about Abraham, God said, over and over again, God said, God said. They didn't have the written law of God. They didn't have the written Old Testament at the, in the time of Abraham and before Abraham. <clears throat> and yet, <clears throat> they were under the direct direction of the Lord. The Lord said it was under the verbal law of God. What about the Jew? Well, we all know that the nation of Israel was under the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, the moral and ceremonial aspects of the law. Actually, that's, not, that's a, it's a good way to distinguish in the Old Testament law between moral and ceremonial, those aspects like the Ten Commandments, which many consider to be the moral law, and the ceremonial law, which is all of the other rituals and regulations and so on. Uh, but it's not a biblical terminology. It's not a biblical distinction that's made. And in many cases, well, in all cases, I believe the ceremonial relates to the character of God as well in a different way, the work of God. But the Jew was under the Mosaic Law. What about the heathen, the Gentiles? Law of conscience. You know, we looked at this in uh, Romans chapter 1. Let's just read some of these verses again. In verse 19 of chapter 1, because that which is known about God is evident within them was known within them. And verse 20, For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood <clears throat> through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. <clears throat> and in verse 32, For although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they also not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. And in chapter 2, we read about the conscience of the Gentiles. For when Gentiles, verse 14, who do not have law, do instinctively the things of the law, these are not, these not having the law are the law to themselves, in that they show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing and defending them. The heathen, you could say, are under the law of conscience. It's not described that way in the New Testament as far as I know exactly, specifically, the law of conscience, but they are under the their conscience. God created them. We'll look at this in a little more detail next week uh, on the nature. Where, wh what is the conscience? And uh, how is it used by God? But uh, the Gentiles have a conscience. And, <clears throat> next please. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's that by which they will be judged. It's not to say that they're without sin because they're all, they've all sinned. Now, the, some might ask the question, well, what about those who've never heard? You know, it's like a uh, a great plague, like a pandemic that people are talking about that might come. And maybe you've got, say in the West, we've got, uh, we're de we've developed some kind of a, um, <clears throat> a way of vaccinating or uh, protecting people against this pandemic. But we've only got a limited supply or we haven't been able to make enough. And so many people die. I mean, there's actually, every week there's probably a million people that die in the world, many of them without Christ. Um, because the, the uh, antidote and we're talking, in this case is not available. So as far as the heathen is concerned, um, it's like it, it, you could compare it to uh, a pandemic in a sense. And the pandemic is sin and death and hell and the lake of fire. What about the born-again believer? Under which law is the born-again believer? The law of the Spirit through grace. And we've read about that last... Uh, two weeks ago in chapter 6, verse 14, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And in uh, Romans chapter 8, here's another law. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So we need to make clear that the born-again believer, some might say, well, is he under the Ten Commandments? No, we're not under the Ten Commandments. We're under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, as was mentioned earlier this morning, the Spirit will not lead us in, con in a direction contrary to anything that's in God's Word. Will not lead us contrary to that. <clears throat> but we'll look at that more next, next week because there is a struggle that takes place within each one, each believer, between uh, the flesh and the spirit. What about the law? It's annulment. We've read that uh, 
we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were bound. We want to look at, first of all, its release and its replacement. Now, just imagine for a minute um, this young woman who meets this fellow, and he's, he's a great guy, really. Her mother is so happy that she's met this person. I mean, he, he, is, he is just what she pictured as being ideal for her. You know, he's a really a good person. He does everything right. He's, he's just, you know, he's almost perfect, you could say, in a way. I mean, he appears to be perfect. And his name is Mr. Law. Actually, Mr. Moses Law, if you want to give him his full name. And so she marries him. That's really in the first four verses here. She marries him. But she finds that things are a little different than she expected. Because on the first day, and he's in the first morning, um, she finds that, well, this goes on day after day. She gets up and she makes his breakfast and she doesn't do his eggs quite right. And they're either done too much or not enough. One day it's too much. One day it's not enough. She can never seem to satisfy him. And uh, <clears throat> his toast is either uh, done too brown or it's not burnt enough. And, you know, this is in, you know, he keeps correcting her, and showing her how that it's just not right. She can never seem to satisfy him. When he goes off, he leaves her a whole list of things that she's to do throughout the day. And he goes back at night and checks it all off. And, well, you didn't do this and this and this. And you, you did this one wrong and so on. And, and this goes on day after day. And she tries harder and harder. The next day, you know, she does a little better at some of these things. But, you know, you're still not, you know, not doing it properly. And it, it continues. And she becomes so frustrated and so discouraged and so depressed because she tries as hard as humanly possible to do what would satisfy him, what would please Mr. Law, Mr. Mosaic Law, her husband. And you know, she gets to the point, she just, oh, I wish I was dead. I wish he was dead. She knows that she can't divorce him. She might consider that, but she knows that, well, to, to divorce him and marry someone else is adultery. I can't do that. So, what happens eventually is, of course, what happens is that he dies. I mean, to bring this up to the 20th century, he dies. And she's free, in a sense, to be married to another. And so she meets another person. And again, he is so, he's just the same as the first person in many ways. He's good and kind and righteous. He's, he appears to be Mr. Perfect. Her mother is so pleased she's found this second person to be married to. And she finds that things are quite different. This, this new person is Mr. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Resurrection and Life. That's his name. Resurrection Life. And <coughs> he is so different because now she finds that aside, not, not the obligations, it's just a pleasure to cook his eggs just the way he likes or his toast and, and uh, to do all of these things. In fact, you know, he comes along and beside her and enables her to do these things. He actually is almost doing it for her. I mean, uh, you know, she doesn't have to worry about the wrinkle in the bed that she didn't make it quite right. I mean, he's there helping her make the bed in a sense. I mean, he's right there encouraging her, supporting her. He's right with her. And this is such a, a turn of events. And this is what we read in the first four verses. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who are under the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another Therefore, my brethren, this is where, in the Scripture, there's a little switch made. The woman hasn't, it's not, the, it's not the, uh, her first husband that's died, but she has died. Death separates 
you know, we're, we're married till death do us part. She dies. The believer dies. Has been crucified with Christ on the cross. Buried and raised again. This is the truth we've been looking at as we've been going through Romans. This is the fact of what's happened. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, released from the law. So she finds that she has been released. Death brings freedom and release in uh, verses 3 and in verse 6a. Died, how? To be joined to another in verse a, 4a. Therefore, my brethren, you also are made to die to the law. Why? That you might be joined to another. That's the purpose. Died to, live a, uh, to bear fruit, the end of verse 4, who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. Freed from fleshly passions, in verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from that, released from the law, and we live in the power of the Holy Spirit. So in your outline, we could say that we are released from the power and requirements of law, and I use this in the most general sense, not just the Ten Commandments. We are released from the requirements of law, from the principle of law, from the, uh, as, as defined by the dictionary, Vine's dictionary, from that principle, for that influence over us. We are released from the requirements of law. How? It's through our co-crucifixion with Christ. We are dead to that. We've been co-crucified with Christ on the cross, dead to self, dead to sin, dead to law, and dead to the world in Galatians 6 and 14. You can look these verses up from your outline later on if you wish, but in uh, chapter 6, verses 3 to 11, we have um, the fact that we've been crucified with Christ. We've been buried, we've been raised to walk in a newness of life. And we are dead to sin. Here we have, we are dead to the law. In chapter 7, and in Galatians 6 and 14, we're dead to the world. We are released from the power of law through our co-crucifixion with Christ on the cross. Well, what about the replacement? Dead to one, well, what's replaced it? There's no point in, in uh, losing one without having something to replace it. And we have something that's new in source. The source of the new is God and not man. And, <clears throat> and you can read this in various uh, passages. In Romans 6 and 4, we've been raised to walk in newness of life. In our chapter 7, verse 6, the newness of the Spirit. It's a new source, newness of the Spirit. In uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5 and verse 17, the new creation nature. We've been made new creatures. In Ephesians, we're found that we're in Christ and the walk that we have in Christ. And even there we, we read concerning our position in Christ that we are, verse 6, we are raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenlies. He is our source. God is now our source, not ourselves. Man in it, new in efficacy. God's effectiveness, not man's ineffectiveness. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 5, we've read, we've read those verses earlier. And it says in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 3, that not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy... Who is our adequacy? Where does it come from? It's from God, in verse 5. It's God's effectiveness, not our ineffectiveness. It's new in kind, powerful, not weak. When Jesus left in uh, the first chapter of Acts... Uh, he was going to send the Spirit to give you power from on high. And it's the same thing over in chapter 8 of Romans, uh, verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did 
sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And you can read also in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7 concerning the power, this new uh, <clears throat> type that we have. It's the new, the new life, the new nature is powerful. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power, is it of us? It's of God and not from ourselves. It's new in its effects. It's internal, not external. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within the believer. And some of the passages there, seven, Romans 7 and 22, moving on fairly quickly here. Uh, For I joyfully concur, con, concur with the law of God in the inner man. It's now the law of the Spirit inside, not that external law. It's new in quality. It produces life, not death. We read that in, in uh, chapter 8 and verse 2. And it's new in extent. It's eternal and not temporal. It continues throughout eternal. We have this replacement, and it's in the Spirit. So the law has been replaced by something new and better. We are reunited to God by the new birth and empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit to live a new life consistent with the moral character of God. This is the new. The old has passed away. Going back to our, our illustration of the, uh, the story of Spurgeon and of the woman who was afraid of the rent collector. You know, let us not be afraid of the rent collector. You know, staying in our comfortable area, the rent collector is the law. I mean, there's one who has paid the debt, our sin debt, fully. That church paid her rent for a period of time. We have one who has paid, fully paid our sin debt and has released us from all the claims of the debt collector. We have been set free to be indwelt by the Spirit of God himself, to be indwelt by God, to be led by God, to be directed by the Lord, to live this new life from him. And may it be so. On your outline, I just put a couple of, some verses on the back of the outline, which really are the key. Um, verse 6 of chapter 7, and those verses in, in chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which relate to the fact that we have been released from the law. And next week, Lord willing, we'll look at being released from the struggle. The struggle that we face every day. The things we want to do, but don't do. And the things that we do, that we don't want to do. And what is taking place within, within us, in terms of that struggle? Exactly what's going on within. What is the struggle? What is the nature of the struggle? And how do we have victory in that struggle? And it's through the Lord himself, through the Spirit. Father, thank you for your word. These truths in the book of Romans are uh, indeed encouraging and strengthening and fundamental for our spiritual growth to realize that we have been made anew, that the redemption that has been provided through the Lord Jesus Christ, the extent of this is so vast, goes beyond the forgiveness of our sins. It goes to the very heart of our, our difficulty, our sin nature, our rebellion, Father, and that you have provided escape. You have released us from the penalty of the law, and you've released us from its power. And we have been joined to another, even to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name.